The coronavirus pandemic has made one thing crystal clear. The health of people, animals, and the environment are closely linked, and we need a better understanding of how they can affect each other. Because when the planet suffers, human beings do too. That's our topic today. We'll also look at the connection between nutrition and COVID-19 infections, and show the impact illness can have on our state of mind. But first, we consider the risk of disease transition between animals and humans. Scientists are studying gorillas in the Republic of Congo to discover more. It is five o'clock in the morning and Rabi Bukaka is already trekking through the Congolese jungle. Early mornings are the best time for the young environmental scientist to search for and study the gorillas. After a one-hour trek, he spots some. Under strict precautions, he tries to observe them, study their behavior. The mask is to avoid contamination, airborne contamination with the gorillas. With coronavirus, it's important that we protect the animals against the disease because we know that when the disease migrates from humans to animals and then possibly back to humans, it gets very complicated. The north of Congo Brazzaville is home to the western lowland gorillas. Thousands live here. Nowhere else in the world can you find such a density of gorillas. How dangerous is COVID-19 for them? That's a question Rabi Bukaka and his research group often debate, but they simply don't have an answer yet. After a silverback got seriously sick with COVID in a US zoo, they've been very careful. They keep at least 25 meters away from the gorillas and everyone here is vaccinated. In the early 2000s, Ebola killed almost 5,000 gorillas. That disease was most likely transmitted by bats, possibly from eating the same fruits. That's why Ravi Bukaka and a group of students from the University of Brazzaville are also researching the area's massive bat population. It's very important to follow up on bat pathogens because there's a local community that eats bats. And scientifically, we know that there's a risk of transferring disease from bats to humans. We need to know and avoid that kind of transmission and possibly also forecast what could become future diseases, like your future coronavirus. In the capital Brazzaville, there are several high-risk places for the spillover of diseases from animals to humans, bushmeat markets. While selling endangered species like gorillas and chimpanzees is illegal, many other varieties of bushmeat can be bought here. Rabi Bukaka can understand that local residents hunt and eat bushmeat to make a living. But he is opposed to bushmeat markets where he says endangered species are also often sold illegally. These are markets that can be considered breeding grounds for diseases. In those markets, viruses can be easily transferred from animals to humans. And when someone contracts the disease, it quickly spreads to others. It can easily escalate from epidemic to pandemic. That's the danger of those markets. To prevent future disease outbreaks among the gorillas, the scientists have increased surveillance, creating an early warning system. The research base is the core of the Congo Conservation Company, whose research is financed by ecotourism. It also creates employment for the community, encouraging participation in conservation efforts. But they want to keep the number of tourists low. We don't want to push on the gorillas too much. And also we don't want to have a, a kind of factory and like a lot of people coming in, coming in, coming in. We want to keep it uh, as pos calm as possible to be able uh, to manage that with the park and with the conservation aspect. We don't want mass tourism here. The Congo Basin is the second largest rainforest in the world, often referred to as the Earth's African lung. It absorbs more greenhouse gases than the entire continent emits. And it has a unique and diverse ecosystem. In the meantime, Rabi Bukaka is getting ready for his next trek to the gorillas. He has a few more weeks for his research here before returning to the capital to write his master's thesis. 
I think I'll never get tired of seeing the gorillas. For me, it's a dream. It's a dream to be here. To be able to go and see them is a dream. I can spend all day long watching them. For me, that's the life I want to live. Ravi Bukaka wants more Congolese to appreciate the environment and study natural sciences. In his master's course, there are currently only four students. Diseases that can pass from animals to humans and then on to other humans are called zoonoses. Researchers are quite worried that the number of zoonoses will increase in the future. But how do they come about in the first place? Malaria, salmonella, influenza, and corona all have something in common. They are zoonoses, or diseases transmitted from animals to humans. More than half of all known infectious diseases started out in animals, and the trend is increasing. For new diseases like COVID-19, as many as three quarters came from animals. Zoonotic diseases can be caused by bacteria, as well as viruses, parasites, or fungi. One way of getting infected is through direct contact with bodily fluids, for example, through a bite or a scratch. But there are also indirect methods of transmission, like through aquarium water or dirty food bowls. In addition, infections can be contracted when drinking contaminated water or eating animal products. It's possible to catch salmonella from eggs or chicken meat. And then there are diseases such as malaria or Lyme disease, which are transmitted by vectors like insects or ticks. But to actually make a person sick, an animal pathogen must overcome a number of barriers in our bodies. Let's look at a virus, for example. First, it has to be able to enter the human body. Then it must escape the immune system. The virus must be able to infect human cells and then use those cells to replicate. When a human catches the disease from an animal, this is known as a spillover event. This can remain an isolated case or as was the case with the coronavirus, it can develop into a pandemic. But a wider spread will only occur if the virus is easily transmittable between humans. And that's not always the case. The probability of zoonotic diseases emerging has increased in recent decades. One reason is ongoing environmental destruction and humans encroaching upon the natural habitat of wild animals. Another is that intensive agriculture and animal husbandry are increasing. Farm animals and pets can also pass germs to humans. To prevent this transmission, it is important to practice simple hygiene measures, like hand washing. At the same time, according to the UN and WHO, we also need more sustainable agriculture and a stronger focus on the link between animal, human and environmental health. For example, having your dog vaccinated against rabies and thereby protecting yourself from the disease. The coronavirus has certainly raised awareness of zoonoses. But it's not the first time scientists have studied the relationship between human and animal health. African swine fever has also caught researchers' attention. This is the village of Purbright in Surrey in the UK. It's a quintessentially English village. It has a medieval church with weekly congregations, a duck pond, and it's surrounded by green hills and cows. There's no way of knowing from visiting the village, but just a couple of kilometers away is the UK's premier facility for investigating killer diseases in farm animals. The Purbright Institute is funded by the British government and researchers study viruses like foot and mouth disease and avian flu. Dr. Linda Dixon leads a group that's studying African swine fever. African swine fever is a very drastic disease of domestic pigs and wild boar. So it kills almost all of the animals that it infects. It's very difficult to control because there's no vaccine and it persists in meat products and in uh, the environment, so it can be very easily transmitted between pigs and 
cause very large outbreaks. The disease is more resistant to environmental factors than COVID. It can survive for years in frozen carcasses, for example, and several months in processed meat like sausages or ham. So humans can easily pass the virus to boar or pigs through rubbish. This means the disease can spread like wildfire. The current pandemic has been going on for 15 years. In 2018, it hit China. African swine fever killed 40% of China's pig population between 2018 and 2019. This is where things start to get interesting with the COVID-19 pandemic. China not only saw a large outbreak of swine fever in 2019, it was also where the first coronavirus cases were reported in humans in that same year. We asked Professor Dixon what the impact of a sudden drop in the Chinese pig population could have meant for people's diets. They would have been looking for other sources of protein to compensate for um, the very high prices of pork and the scarce availability availability of pork. Obviously it could include wildlife, so either hunting or farming of other other species apart from pigs. Um, so there could have been increased consumption of like wildlife, um, hunted animals, anything that brings uh, the human population into closer contact with wildlife would in increase the risk of zoonotic spread from wildlife to humans. Researchers say COVID-19 may have been made more likely by the pressure put on alternative meat sources due to a lack of pork, resulting from the African swine fever pandemic. That's because it's thought that a wild species such as raccoons, civet cats or pangolins served as an intermediary host, allowing the coronavirus to pass to humans from horseshoe bats. So anything that brought humans closer to that intermediary host could have increased the chance of the virus jumping from host to humans. One of the main ways to protect pigs is with a vaccine, which Dixon is working on. But it's no small task. The genetic complexity of African swine fever is about six times that of the uh, coronavirus is circulating currently, and about 15 times as complex as uh, flu, which people are also familiar with. Complexity means it's hard to train the pig's body to be able to recognize the virus. But Dr. Dixon does have several promising vaccine candidates waiting for testing with a vaccine company. In the meantime, just like the COVID-19 pandemic brought to light the importance of public health, researchers are hoping that the African swine fever pandemic could serve to raise awareness of just how destructive animal diseases can be. Since the start of the pandemic, DW science correspondent Derek Williams has been following developments and answering your questions. This week, he talks about an unattractive side effect, trash. Samuel wants to know, what happens with the billions of syringes being used during the pandemic? Used syringes are viewed as potentially hazardous medical waste, um, not only because they can leave holes in you if they're not handled correctly, but also because they're a possible source of infection when and if they leave those holes. Um, they're classified as what are called uh, sharps or, or medical devices that have points or edges that can cut or puncture the skin. So a primary concern when getting rid of them is making sure that the needles won't injure and possibly infect anyone during or after their disposal. Um, with many syringes, the needles can be removed, and in some places, the plastic part of the syringe is recycled. But in a lot of countries, that isn't an option, so, so they often end up in municipal waste. According to the World Health Organization, vaccination drives against COVID-19 last year more than doubled the number of shots administered worldwide compared to pre-pandemic years. And since reusing vaccine syringes is a bad idea for several reasons, that ends up being a whole lot of plastic waste, um, close to, to 50,000 tons of it from the syringes alone, a recent WHO report says. And, 
And that's not even taking into account the packaging and the empty vaccine vials or the puncture resistant disposal containers that, that sharps end up in. But when it comes to waste caused by the pandemic, both, both plastic and otherwise, syringes are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, one study mentioned in that WHO report, for instance, estimated that at times during the pandemic, humanity was going through more than 3 billion single-use masks every single day. Now, it's hard to pin down exactly how much plastic waste has been produced directly as a response to the pandemic, because any list would have to include everything from the ramped up production of a wide range of personal protective equipment items to the plastic cartridges used in many COVID-19 test kits. But, but there's no question that it's millions and millions of tons, and a significant amount of that waste will eventually end up not in disposal sites, but in the environment where it will continue to have an impact long after the pandemic ends. Looking after your health is particularly important during a pandemic. But in these times of lockdowns and working remote, people around the world are increasingly grabbing for unhealthy food and snacks and moving a lot less. We talked with a nutrition expert about the link between excess weight and infection risk and how we can improve our eating habits. The coronavirus can affect our sense of taste. Foods we enjoyed before suddenly taste like nothing, or even revolting. But there's another link between what we eat and COVID-19. Here in Germany, the virus is encountering a society made ill by poor eating habits that makes us susceptible to severe corona cases. Diet-related illnesses like obesity, high blood pressure and diabetes are on the rise in many societies. In Europe, an estimated 53% of adults are overweight, and that number is growing all the time. It's creating a new problem, diabetes. The World Health Organization says 60 million people in Europe suffer from it. Then there's cardiovascular disease. It's the most common cause of death worldwide, killing some 17 million people each year. The pathophysiological background for severe COVID cases is that over the years, all these diet-related diseases cause chronic inflammation, which weakens the immune system, making it more susceptible. We heard many recommendations during the pandemic and followed many rules. Wash your hands, wear masks, keep your distance, get vaccinated. But no one in authority recommended changing our diet. Why not? With nutrition, with the preventive effect of healthy nutrition, we have a fundamental psychological communication problem. This is that the preventive effect of diet is very effective, but only in the long term. We need a VAT reform. This is the concept of the so-called healthy value-added tax. So abolish VAT concessions for animal-based foods, but at the same time subsidize vegetables, fruit, legumes, or slap an excise tax on sugary drinks, the so-called sugar tax. But we can also decide for ourselves to eat differently every day. As little sugar as possible, because sugar actually only makes us fat and sick. Reduce alcohol, because alcohol increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. Lots of vegetables, in turn, lower the risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Legumes and nuts are excellent sources of protein. And nuts also contain valuable fatty acids. The odd glass of wine, a few brownies or chips are perfectly fine. But when you're overweight, diabetic, or have heart disease, that's when you've eaten yourself into a real quandary. While some turn to food for comfort, others are turning to prescription medication and illicit drugs. 
In Brazil, many young people seek relief from mental health crises by taking mood-altering substances. But there are alternatives. Four years have passed since Giovanni Paiva Moreira was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. It was triggered by marijuana use. He now participates in therapeutic activities like Reiki to overcome anxiety. The coronavirus lockdowns meant that he was cooped up at home for months, which sent him back into a deep depression he thought he'd long overcome. I couldn't get out of bed. When I did something, nothing made sense. I felt empty and hopeless. I felt sure that I was never going to get better because I'd already tried many medications and had thought about suicide. I'd even attempted it. Many young people have suffered from symptoms of anxiety during the pandemic. According to a UNICEF report, 73% of Latin American teens have felt the need to seek help for physical or mental discomfort caused by social isolation. Changes in habits, mourning the death of family members, economic uncertainty and the risk of infection have also caused new cases of depression among youths. Young people, teenagers, are venturing out into the world, socializing, exploring their sexuality. When that process isn't allowed in such a strict way, that can lead to a lot of complications of the kind that we're seeing right now. Those problems can be traced back to a lack of social interaction and social activities. I'm seeing a lot of patients who are asking me for a doctor's note that will allow them to stay home rather than return to in-person schooling. The mask mandate for outdoor areas has gone, but teens are now facing an even bigger problem, the jarring reality of life post-restrictions. Because of these changes, the use of psychoactive substances has spiked among teenagers. Drug use has increased due to the pandemic. That's having a significant impact. Today we had to hospitalize a teenager who'd taken several drugs over a three-day period, and he ended up experiencing psychosis. Science has begun to investigate the effects of psychoactive substances to make medications to combat depression. Ayahuasca is a medicinal plant native to the American people. But what's the active substance and what effects can it have? DMT is a psychedelic substance comparable to others like LSD, lysergic acid, mescaline, psilocybin, substances used in the 60s. It belongs to the same class of molecules as serotonin in a way that reminds us of antidepressant drugs that basically, according to the theory of monoamine neurotransmitters, are based on boosting the contribution of serotonin to the synaptic pathway. Ayahuasca is only legal in Brazil for religious uses. Many organizations in the country use these substances for rituals. Michaela Lopez learned about the Santo Daime ritual from her uncle at a family dinner when she was 15. The religious practice revitalizes indigenous rituals that are combined with Catholicism and the consumption of the ayahuasca drink. Now 20, she's convinced that thanks to ayahuasca, she could overcome her fears and problems with family and friends. I believe that the daimi gave me awareness of my attitudes, how I connected to people, the things that I did, what I ate. So for me, the daimi expanded my consciousness. The priest of the congregation that Michaela attends weekly warns that the drink should not be consumed outside the context of the religious ritual. Outside of this context, the people aren't consuming it in a controlled way, and so the substance can have unexpected effects. Scientific advances could be leading us into a new era of antidepressants. But the abuse and misuse of substances can be dangerous. DMT should not be used by patients who are taking antidepressants. And when someone is in treatment for a psychotic disorder, like schizophrenia, or if they have a history of psychotic episodes, using DMT can be quite dangerous.
Os resultados podem ser muito perigosos. Young people still have many challenges to face in the post-lockdown world, but with society now more face-to-face -face and socially active again, they can at least hope the way forward will be easier. In this week's COVID-19 special, we've tried to highlight links between humans and animals, the mind and the body, and ways of coping with crisis. The current pandemic has demonstrated that a better understanding of these relationships will help us prepare for future pandemics. That includes taking a long, hard look at some of the numbers we've been looking at since launching this program two years ago. And that's what we'll be doing on next week's show. Until then, stay safe and take care.